All right, Romans chapter number one this morning. That's, my Bible just opens there automatically, so go ahead and knock this out. We're going to finish uh, next uh, Sunday, Lord willing. Uh, we'll finish up our spring look at Romans and our look at Romans one, and then we pick up in the fall. If you look at verse um, thirty. Two, uh, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them. We're going to start out our look at chapter 2 with that verse and we're going to spend uh, several messages on the things the Bible says please God and that will be a blessing. And then we'll uh, take some time and look at the seven possibly eight judgments in the Bible. The judgment of people just say judgment of God but it's it's bigger than God saying this is wrong and that's wrong. We've got the uh, judgment seat of Christ and judgment of nations and judgment of principalities and powers and the white throne judgment. We talk about all those things. And it'd be nice to talk about somebody else for a change besides us. It's, it's, it's rough when the Bible's about you, isn't it? Amen. All right, well. So this morning, that's a great way to start your rainy Sunday. Verse 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affections. Here's a word you hadn't heard all week. Implacable. Implacable. Unmerciful. Implacable. You know what it is to placate? How many know that word? To, to appease or pacify or conciliate. Someone who is implacable is someone who cannot be pacified or rendered peaceable. They cannot be appeased. They're stubborn. They're constantly in enmity. You ever know anybody like that? They just, they're not happy unless they're unhappy. They, they, they got something stirred up with somebody all the time. They, they, they walk, in, walk in their own living room and just an argument starts. If there's nothing to argue about, they just make something up. And you, and you can't deal with them. You can't reason with them. There are, there are some people, in the, according to the Bible, there are some people that the grace of God could help, but it can't help. And there are some people that the saints of God really seem powerless to do anything about. If you, and it wouldn't be anybody here, but, but in some churches this morning, there are, there are people, and they just, they're not going to settle it. They're not going to get over it. They're not going to make it right because then they wouldn't be happy. They're not, they're not happy unless they got something stirred up with somebody all the time. God have mercy on their wife. God have mercy on their husband. It just, man can't, can't do a thing right. He just moves up on the corner of the housetop and sits there. He'd rather sit in the hot sun, rather sit in the pouring rain than be downstairs in that, in that living room. Just how it is. Some people, they, they've, been in, they've been in every church in town and no church suits them. They've been in every church within 100 miles of where they live. And the pastor, every, every one of them, the pastor's wrong, the people are wrong. They, you know, at, at some point, if everybody's wrong but you, maybe it's you. If everybody's got a bad attitude but you, maybe everybody's got a good attitude and you just can't fit in with people with a good attitude. But that's, that's uh, implacable. So we'll run some verses on that this morning because, well, it'd be good. Have Bible study on somebody else, because none of us is implacable. Amen. Don't look around. I Man, I was preaching one night in a little church in uh, Concord, North Carolina, and probably they just they had one one row of pews and and or one section, and the thing only went back about eight, maybe nine rows. And I, I was preaching about anger and people who couldn't control their anger. And there's a man and a woman sitting in the back row, and she had her arm around him. And every time I'd make a point, she'd raise her arm and she'd point at him from behind his head. I'm trying so hard not to laugh, and I thought, well, no, no wonder the guy's got anger issues. <laughs> you got your, got your wife calling you out <laughs> while the preacher's preaching. So anyway, if you're sitting this morning with someone who's implacable, don't point at them from behind their head while I'm, while I'm doing it, because... Might be on one of our 300 cameras that we got around here. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, please bless those boys and girls in the Sunday school this morning. Not, not just in our church, but in every church today, God, that will preach the truth of your word. And pray, God, that many precious children come to know uh, the truth about and believe on 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, God, for uh, adult uh, congregations, again, across the nation, around the world today. And God, that this be a great day of souls being saved. I pray, God, the day that uh, some man gets saved and fixes home, and some woman gets saved and it rescue her marriage, and some young person gets saved today, Lord, and they'd never, ever, ever have to venture out of that world and, and into all that sin. And uh, please, God, just have your way in our time together, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and amen. All right, Romans chapter 12, let's go there. Romans chapter 12. You know, another thing, the, um, the definers, those that tell us uh, the meaning of these words say about implacable, uh, says, uh, such persons will not be reconciled where there is a quarrel or who pursue the offender with unyielding revenge. Implacable, some people are implacable, they just, they got to get even. They got to settle the score. I mean, why forgive when you can drag it on until you exact the last measure of revenge out of the thing? And I, I'll tell you something us older folks know that young people don't know. You can't get even. You can't settle scores. You can't make people pay the full measure of what you think they ought to pay for what they did to you because their life's gone on and your life's gone on and everybody involved, their life has gone on. You can never get everybody back to the point where an offense happened and undo it. So best thing for you to do, just, just get your eyes on Jesus and forget what somebody did that was wrong or what you think somebody did that was wrong. I tell you, a lot of these things where somebody comes in, this great big story about how somebody offended them, a great big story about how, how somebody did them wrong, and you're sitting there thinking, that's it? You're, in the, you're at this level of outrage over that? Why don't you join the Marine Corps and get in a war sometime and see what, what a bad time is like? Why don't you just, just sign up and spend five years in prison sometime and see what a bad time is like? I mean, people think their whole lives are ruined over somebody uh, stepping on their toes one time about some little thing. Get over yourself. I mean, none of us are that important to make as big a deal out of, out of uh, somebody slighting us because we're all slight. <laughs> I mean, look, the fact of the matter is we get offended because we think too highly of ourselves. And we hang on to that offense because we won't humble ourselves. It's not about the other person did you wrong. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Suppose they did. Why do you deserve to be done right? I mean, who am I that everybody should treat me right all the time? Who am I that everybody should talk to me like with, with dignity and respect and honor and we, we, we nod our head to those verses about being sinners and coming short of the glory of God, but God forbid anybody else should, should act on that. <laughs> you know, I know I'm a sinner. I know I come short of the glory of God. I know I don't deserve a thing, but you better not agree with that. <laughs> you better treat me like the Lord himself. Well, that's not going to happen. Anyway, uh, so I think a lot of times, too, people just have unex unrealistic expectations. They come into a church, several hundred people in a church, and they expect everybody there is going to like them. And everybody there is going to be as impressed with them as they're impressed with themselves. And everybody there is going to treat them right every single encounter. Where'd you get an idea like that? Not from the Bible. What in the Bible would make you think 200 people get together two, three, four times a week and nobody ever do or say anything they shouldn't do or say? Unrealistic expectations. You talked about, well, I used to go to church, but somebody there hurt my feelings. Well, how could somebody there not hurt your feelings? Your feelings are all over the place. <laughs> you can't walk around some people stepping on their feelings. That's all they are is feelings. Anyway, better read some Bible. Romans 12, 18. Here's a great verse. Or go back, go back. Uh, 15. 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. If you don't do that, you got no business bothered by how somebody treats you. And weep with them that weep. See, people get, get offended and they get uh, implacable because other people didn't weep when they wept and other people didn't rejoice when they rejoiced. Why is it a one-way street? Well, people aren't nice to me. And give me a list of the names of the people you're nice to. Well, people aren't friendly toward me, and you're just overly friendly all the time, and nobody responded in kind. I mean, come on. 
16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense no man evil for evil. Now why would that be in the Bible if no one was going to recompense you evil? Or, or do you evil? See what he said? Just plan ahead of time. If somebody does you wrong, you're not going to try and settle the score. What would make you think, well, I found a church. Nobody there is going to do me wrong. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Now watch, 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You know what God just said there? That, that's an admission from the Holy Spirit. There are some people, no matter what you do, it's not going to work. No matter how hard you try, it's not going to happen. Everything that's in me, I poured into that husband, that wife, that friend, that child, that brother or sister in Christ, and no matter what I did, they still complained, they still found fault, they still didn't want to mend the relationship. Okay, that's on them. God said, you know what God said? Make sure it's not on you. There are people who are implacable. There's nothing that lies within you that is sufficient to fix that relationship. But make sure you've done everything you can to fix that relationship. Now, I don't want to be that other person. I don't, be, I don't want to be the one who can't be reconciled with. I don't want to be the one who can't have something patched up. I just want to keep it going till the whole thing blows up. I was hurt. I was offended. We're going to get divorced. I don't care. Well, can't we work it out? No. Well, can't we try? No. Well, can't we see somebody? No. You know what that is? Implacable. Brother, why are you leaving? Well, somebody there at the church didn't do me right. Well, let's work it out. No, I, 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 I don't want to. Well, that's not on the church. You can spend the rest of your life saying the church, but it's not the church. It's you. But our, our responsibility here is to make sure that we, we, as much as we possibly can, that we live peaceably with all men. All right, 1 Corinthians 1. Or, no, no, Colossians, I'm sorry. Colossians chapter 1. Let's go there. Colossians 1. Some people are beyond the reach. Colossians 1. Now look what God can do. Uh, verse number 19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, uh, isn't that a blessing? We weren't just alienated from God, that's, that's natural. But many of us were enemies of God, that is, we fought actively against God, and why? What was the, what was the issue? Wicked works. We weren't against a God of grace and a God of love and a God of mercy and a God who sent His Son to die on a cross. We were against a God who we suspected was going to call on us to stop doing some things if we entered a relationship with Him. Isn't that right? When you get out there witnessing lost people, whether it's Church Street or UCF or downtown Deland with the Stetson students or any of it, they never say, well, I, I got an argument with you. I don't, why is God gracious? They never say that. Why is God merciful? They never say that. Why is God kind? They never say that. They say, well, what's wrong with drinking? What's wrong with being a homosexual? What's wrong with living together? You know why they're enemies against God? Because of their wicked works. They don't want to give up their wicked works. So you've got wicked preachers all over town who've set up churches where God doesn't concern himself with people's wicked works. And they pretend like they're, you know, they're fast-growing assemblies. And anyway, so aren't you glad God reconciles people who are his enemies? Now, look at verse number 20. Having made peace through the blood of his cross... By him to reconcile all things unto himself. So this morning, let, let's imagine, it would never happen here, but let's imagine that here in our church, there's a saved man who is angry with another saved man. 
and one or the other of those saved men has tried to work it out, but it can't be worked out. Do you know why? Because one saved man considers the slight that you directed toward me of greater importance than the blood of Jesus Christ. If the important thing in each of those men's lives was that Jesus shed his blood for them and they are washed in that blood, they would have an everlasting basis of fellowship. But if the most important thing in that person's life is, you took my seat. Well, but brother, we're both saved. You took my seat. But brother, we're washed in the blood. But you took my seat. But brother, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lives inside you, but you took my seat. You know why a person is implacable? Because they are more important to themselves than the blood of Christ. They are more important to themselves than everything that has to do with salvation. When you, when you everything else in the world goes away. When you disrespect me, everything else in the world goes away. You don't realize I'm so important that I can't be your friend because you just want to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. What about me? You know, right now, somewhere in America, right now, somewhere in America, there's a saved man and a saved woman who are living separately and hiring separate attorneys and they are going to terminate their marriage. You know why? Because whenever they get together under that roof, the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't matter, the death of Christ on the cross doesn't matter, the resurrection of Christ doesn't matter, the Holy Spirit doesn't matter, the Word of God doesn't matter, the salvation of their souls and other people's souls doesn't matter. What matters is I'm not getting treated the way I want to be treated. You know what you are? You're implacable. You can't be reconciled because you consider yourself more important than Jesus Christ. But it's just it. Two saved people could sit together over the table and, talk, and, and open the Bible and read the Bible. There are 66 books full of things to enjoy that you agree upon. But why would two Christians do that when they could fight with each other How do you fix that? You know what Romans 1 says? Unless God gets his rightful place in the heart, you can't fix it. They're implacable. Woo Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. Good morning. Good morning, Hebrews. Hebrews 2. Just a little Sunday school lesson. Hebrews chapter 2. Now here's Christ. He came all the way down from heaven to earth. Watch this. Verse 14, for as much sin as children are partakers of flesh and blood, that's us. He also likewise took part of the same. Jesus Christ became flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Thank God. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Thank God. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful, that's the next hour, and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. You know why Christ came all the way down here? not to continually point out to you the things that you and God disagreed on, but to bring you back into a right relationship with God. Isn't that a blessing? The law spelled out all of my guilt. The law spelled out all of my transgression. Jesus Christ came and said, let me get you back in a right relationship with God. Now let me ask you something. While doctrinally and technically all of us have been taught to say, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. I'm not a Jew under the law, I'm a Christian. Let me ask you something. In your relationships, are you just reciting people's transgressions so they'll know they're guilty? 
Or are you like Jesus Christ, doing what you can to reconcile the guilty to God? Look, the fact that you've had a falling out with someone, okay, there's, there's transgression somewhere, real or imagined. Do you need to keep harping on the transgression, real or imagined, as the law would do? Or do you want to step in as Christ the high priest and exercise your priesthood, 1 Peter chapter number 2, and reconcile? You know, we weren't reconciled to God because we stopped doing all the things that separate us to God. We were reconciled to God because Jesus Christ said, my blood is superior to that. Let me put all that away by my blood and by my grace and bring you to God. You want to fix a problem you got with a, with a brother? Stop reminding him of why you don't like him anymore or why you're angry with him and put it under the blood of Christ and reconcile. You want the marriage troubles to get worse? You want the friendship troubles to get worse? Just keep reciting the list of things you're unhappy about. I don't like that you do this. I don't like that you do that. I don't like that you go here. I don't like that you go there. We know that. We hear it every time we walk through the door. Can somebody be a Christian and put that stuff under the blood and bring the erring one by grace to God for reconciliation? Churches don't split. Rarely, rarely does a church split because false doctrine got in. Sometimes, sometimes a Calvinist uh, take over a Sunday school department and away it goes. And sometimes a hyper-dispensationalist get in, give out enough secret literature to, to tear the thing in two. But usually, usually it splits because this group is, is mad at that group. And this group isn't speaking to that group. And if you try to have a meeting and work it out, the meeting just devolves into another reciting of what we're unhappy about. You know, when you came to Jesus for salvation, he did not stand there and repeat all your sins again. Well, here's why God's mad at you. I know that. I want to be saved. Well, yeah, but you need to really know it. No, you know what he did? By grace, he reconciled us to God. Somebody's unplacable, you just you can't even reach him with this grace. Look at look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I remember hearing um, Brother Roloff say one time about relationships, he said, there's not a question of whether or not you're going to have a falling out. Everybody does. The question is, will you have a falling back in? And that's, that's really profound. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 18, or 17, therefore if any man be in Christ, are you? He's a new creature, old things passed away, behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. How about that? To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Praise God. Now, here, here's, how I, here's how I want to read these verses. You ready? Uh, verse 18 my way. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord, look what Jesus did for me. Verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Praise God, not imputing their trespass unto them. Isn't that great? Look what God's done for me. All my trespasses, all my sins but he loves me so much he doesn't charge me with any of them. You know what part I don't like? That I'm called upon to treat you like he treated me. Look at the end of verse 18. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Your ministry is not to make sure everybody knows how dirty and rotten and wicked they are and how badly they've treated you. Your ministry is to fix that. about that? Verse 19, and hath 
not imputing their trespasses unto them. You, you want to run your wife off, you want to run your husband off, you want to run your kids off, you want to run, want to run your friends off, just constantly impute their trespasses unto them. Just every chance you get, point out to them where they're wrong. Every chance you get, list the things they do that you don't approve of. And then go whine and tell somebody, you know, they're just, I, I don't know why, I, I, I tried to be, no you didn't. You didn't try to be a friend. You didn't try to love anybody. You tried to be the law to bring people to repentance. How about be Jesus Christ and bring them to reconciliation? You know when it's, when it's me that's done wrong? I'm all about God's grace. When it's you that's done wrong, I'm all about repentance, commandments, Right? Man, if we could just simply, it's so simple in the Bible, just treat the other person like we want everybody to treat us, like God has treated us, it'd be, it'd be that easy. Uh, love wins the day. It always wins the day. Your, your little four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, do you know how long a list of transgressions we could make regarding their behavior? You know what you do? You deal with them gently, sometimes not at all, and just continue to bless them. Why? Love, love. But let the spouse transgress. Well, what's the problem? It's not transgression. Your kid's been transgressing all day. Why is it a big problem the spouse transgresses? I'm guessing love's absent. Well, people bring their kids to church, and kids break this rule and that rule. They run when they shouldn't run. They talk when they shouldn't talk. and They, they cut up when they shouldn't cut up. And they don't speak politely to this adult and that adult. And we say, well, you know, it's, it's, it, they'll learn. But the preacher does one thing wrong. And it's a big deal. Some other brother or sister in Christ does something wrong. It's a big deal. Why not the same desire to represent Christ in reconciliation toward everyone that we have toward our own precious little children. It's not that we don't know how to do it. We all know how to do it. We all know how to show love to people who don't do right. We just selectively apply that ability. God wants to apply it to everybody. All right, 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. Now some people, I'm telling you, no matter how hard you try, it's not going to work. But Maybe, maybe we just need to make sure we've tried as hard as, we, hard as we can. Try this, verse 12. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. How about that? Now, I think preachers and deacons and, and parents and Law enforcement, I, I, I think that people in authority, there's a natural resentment toward anybody telling you what to do, but there's also a, a developed resentment when the people telling you what to do uh, have an attitude with it. Isn't that right? I mean, that preacher thinks he's an Old Testament king of Israel rather than a New Testament member of the body of Christ. You're going to have some problems. I understand that. I do. But isn't it interesting that verse number 12 them that uh, are over you in the Lord, I don't like that, and, but God said it, and admonish you, I don't like that, esteem them very highly, well, I don't know about that. And then he says, and be at peace among yourselves. You know what he said? There is a natural tendency for saved people and those who are over them to butt heads. If you've got a natural tendency to resent your employer, the police officer, the president, the, that's not going to change when you walk through a church door. You're going to have a natural tendency to, to resent somebody standing in a pulpit and telling you what to do. Isn't that right? So the Lord puts right in there after that, says, you know what, if you don't deal with that on a regular basis, you're never going to stay in a church anywhere. 
Be at peace among yourselves. All right, back to Old Testament, Leviticus 9. Leviticus chapter 9. Watching the clock, Leviticus 9. Have to do that in a Sunday school hour. Leviticus 9. Is that correct? That is not correct. 19 maybe? Hmm. Yeah, here we go. 19. Leviticus 19. Glad when the mistake's an easy one. Man, if, if we gave you one of these free church pens, that's what it's worth. Free. And they, that's why so many visitors don't come back. We give them these junk pens. <laughs> About one out of three works. <laughs> anyway, Leviticus 19, verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge. See that? That's even under the law. Don't spend your life trying to get even. Nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. You know what God anticipated when we wrote that verse? Somebody's going to do something to you that is grudge worthy. Right? And you're going to want to hang on to that grudge. Come on, that's why it's in the Bible. Well, I went to a church down there and somebody did me wrong. Well, of course they did. But thou, see, never mind what, they, what the other person did, but thou shalt love thy neighbor. I do. As thyself. Okay, I don't. <laughs> I am the Lord. That ain't a preacher saying that. That's not a parent saying that. The Lord said, don't tell me you don't know how to love somebody. You love yourself. Now, in the, in the setting, how do I love someone like I love myself? I want my family members to tolerate all my sin. And I don't want them to hold any of my sin against me. But God forbid they should sin. Right? We all know what to do. We all know how to be placable or to be placated, not to be implacable. It's just how we want others to treat us when we don't measure up. And Lord said, so just flip the thing around and treat the person who doesn't measure up that way. You know, we run this stuff all the time where I do travel around all these churches, and this one doesn't fellowship with that one, and this, this pastor won't speak to that pastor, and, all, and, it's, you know, but, and they can tell you why. Well, he differs with me on that, and they differ with me on that. Well, you know what? Jesus Christ differs with you on pretty much everything you do. And Jesus Christ could look at everything I do and say, that's not good enough. And he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know, there's not a saved person Jesus Christ has broken fellowship with because they're not good enough. You don't have to do everything other people do. But Jesus Christ, the Bible says he was holy, harmless, undefiled, and listen, separate from sinners. He was never isolated from sinners. If you haven't learned to be separated from people aren't as good as you think you are, without separating from them, you're not spiritual. You're not following Christ. You're just insecure and stuck on yourself. Well, we don't talk to that family. They do some things we don't do. Well, you're the sinner. Because Christ talks to them. Well, I would never eat at a church dinner with those people because they, you know, they wipe their mouth with their napkin in their left hand and God knows that say, spiritual people write the napkin in their right hand. Oh, shut up. Jesus Christ is sitting there with you and he doesn't care which hand you use to wipe your mouth when you're using it to bad mouth his children. <laughs> All that stuff. Anyway, got to hurry. James 5 verse 9. James 5, 9, 3 verses in 3 minutes. So well, that's the Old Testament. All right, all right. James 5, 9. You ready? 
Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. You want to get out of the realm of reconciliation and grace and get in the realm of fault finding and judgment? What if Jesus decides to play that game with you? <laughs> I'd be the big loser if the Lord was going to deal with me in regard to my failures rather than deal with me in regard to his grace. So you know what he said? I recommend you deal with others in regard to grace, not in regard to their failures. That's right. 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 7, two more. We, we can do this. 1 Corinthians 7. Romans, Corinthians, there we go. 1 Corinthians 7, Who would you even read this on a Sunday morning? Well, I guess so. Verse number 10, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Well, he's this and that. All right, 11. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. Now, the Lord lays out a scenario here where there is a possibility he might entertain the idea that in, in some situations a spouse might have to leave another spouse. I would never tell a woman to stay in a house where she's getting punched in the face. Okay, that's, that, that's a fair example. Okay? He didn't bring you roses every night. Not a fair example. Punched in the face. Fair example. But you know what the Lord said here? As low down and rotten as God acknowledges that guy is, the objective is reconciliation, not law. See that? Don't be implacable. Don't refuse to be reconciled. That's what he's talking about. All right, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. So well, I'm going to keep going to church, but I'm not going to talk to that guy anymore. I'm going to keep going to church, but I'll never have anything to do with her anymore. I'm just going to worship God and serve God. <laughs> you know, you got people right now sitting in church, and they're, they are, they are, doing what God dared them to do. I dare you, dare any of you to go to law against a brother? There's a man right, somewhere right now, there's a man going to law to divorce his wife rather than be reconciled and sitting in a church this morning thinking he's serving God. You know what Romans 1 says? He's reprobate. He's got a reprobate mind. You're violating everything God said and pretending you're serving God. And vice versa. Women the same way? Now watch, now watch what he said. Verse number uh, 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar. Isn't that not good? You're at the altar. You're bringing a gift. You're worshiping God. Sacrificing. God's, Jesus Christ says, And there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. You know what God said? I don't want to hear your song. I don't want to hear your sermon. I don't want to hear your Sunday school lesson. I don't want, to, I don't want your check in the, in the offering plate. Go fix that thing. Now, who in a fundamentalist church thinks it's more important to reconcile than to obey the legal requirements of the Baptist church? You know what our problem is? We are more oriented to Moses and the law than we are to Jesus Christ and the gospel of grace. We've got congregations sitting happily every Sunday morning listening to a man stand in the pulpit and preach who dumped his wife for his girlfriend. Baptist churches all across America. You know what their problem is? They don't know anything about Christ. You know what Jesus Christ said? Hey, pal, 
put that gift down and go fix that thing. How about that? So it would never happen here, but if you know someone, another church somewhere, who's still singing and giving and attending and participating, but they got a brother they won't talk to or a sister they won't talk to, just pass it on to them. Jesus is not receiving any of that. He said, just put it down and go fix what I told you to fix. Now, if you're the recipient, somebody walks up to you and says, brother, you hurt my feelings, you offended me, don't defend yourself. In his mind, you did. In her mind, you did. Doesn't matter if it's a big deal, a big deal, that. just say, okay, no problem, sorry. That's it. Don't re reply with a list of things. Well, let me tell you what you did to me. <laughs> All right, here's a can of gas. Let's pour it on the fire. Just let it go out. It's not that big a deal. Not that big a deal. Amen. All right, let's pray.